So we're going to talk about gases this afternoon. So if you want a full a full more detailed discussion about the gases, your uh, link was given to you last meeting, and I was hoping that you're going to watch it. But based on the, the view counts, only half of the class watch it. I'm not even sure if it's really one half because some of you might have watched it uh, more than one. So gases, we could say, are element or compounds that exist as uh, one that doesn't have a definite shape and definite volume. So if you're going to look at these uh, elements that exist as gases, those are the ones that are highlighted in blue. Okay, so these are some of the elements that exist as what we call gases, but there's also compounds that exist as gases. Now, these gases usually are the one that can be found at atmospheric pressure of one atmosphere and 25 degree uh, Celsius. Oops. Do you see my screen? I can see your screen. Huh? I can see your screen. Because some said they cannot see their screen. Hmm. Okay, so those who cannot see my screen, you can log out and then log in again. I, I don't know why, but right now what you see is a table 5.1, right? Yeah. Okay, so the table 5.1 just listed all the gases that exist at room temperature and one atmosphere pressure. So you have here the, uh, <clears throat> uh, what do we call this? By element. Okay, or uh, di uh, element gases. Okay, and then we have here the compound. So these are found in what we call uh, gas form. Now, not all of them are clear. Not all of them are what we call odorless. Okay, so for instance, hydrogen sulfide, it's 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 clear, but it's not odorless. It smells like a, a, a rotten egg. Okay, uh, nitri nitrogen dioxide, it's brown gas. Okay, so not all uh, gases are what we call colorless and odorless. So if you're going to look at the physical characteristic of gases as mentioned before at the beginning of the semester, it doesn't have definite shape and definite volume. So it assumes the shape and volume of the container. And among the three physical states, this is the most compressible state of matter. And this is the only one that we're going to talk about among the three physical states this semester. Because the other two, you're going to talk it uh, either with me or with another teacher uh, in Chem 112, the, uh, what we call liquids and solids, okay? Now, uh, the good thing with gases, they will mix evenly and completely when confined to the same container, okay? But they won't react unless you're going to force them, like what happened to nitrogen and hydrogen, if you, increase the pressure and the temperature, they can react to form ammonia, okay? Now, gases have much lower densities than so liquids and solids. If the densities of most of them is gross, uh, grams per ml, gases would have it as grams per liter. So that's how uh, low the density of gases compared to liquids and solids, at least 100 times less, okay? Now, one picture is that gases only uh, exhibit is what we call pressure. So pressure is just equal to force okay, over area. So whenever you have what we call uh, gases, they exert pressure. Okay? Liquid and solids don't have that uh, what we call means or properties of exerting pressure. So pressure can be measured by putting a liquid solution, like in this case, a mercury a solution. And what will happen at atmospheric level, the height of the uh, mercury is around 700, uh, 76, uh, 76 centimeter. Or if you're going to transform it to 700, uh, what we call millimeter, it's 760 millimeter mercury. So that's the basis that I have before to measure vapor pressure. Okay, now pressure can also be the same as uh, force equals to mass times acceleration. Now there are different units of pressure of which you're gonna be given in the exam. So 
you can have the so-called Pascal, which is the SI unit, and Pascal is just one Newton per meter squared. Okay. Now, the one that is commonly used is one atmosphere, which is equals to 760 millimeter mercury, which is equals to 760 torr. Okay. Now, if we're going to compare the uh, value of atmosphere with Pascal, so one atmosphere is equal to 101,321 Pascal. Okay. So if we have what we call the uh, gases, so usually we look at the pressure that's just right. a column of air that we right. expert at sea level. So depending on what we call the higher the elevation of the pressure, uh, uh, the higher the elevation the is, the lower the is the pressure. Okay. Now, application of this is Ooh, what a 20 on the exam. It's not going to go to the order of friends. And we have a final. Okay. Uh, you, you can experience this when you go on top of the mountain. Usually, when you go on top of the mountain, you have a hard time breathing. Okay. And the main reason there is because of the uh, low pressure that it has, there's less amount of gases that you have there. Now, as you go down the sea level, okay, uh, as you sing the song uh, under the sea, so there's much pressure on it that it can, uh, what we could affect your eardrum. Okay, so that's how pressure is affected in terms of elevation. Okay, now manometer is the one that used to uh, measure the gas pressure. So you can have the closed tube like this one. For the open tube. So what it do is just look at the height of whatever liquid that you have there with the gas that you're trying to measure. And whatever the height that you have there, okay, that will give you an equivalent. So usually they use your mercury. So at one atmosphere, the height is around 760 uh, millimeter mercury. Okay. So what they found out when they study the relationship between pressure and volume, so we're going to go on now to these natural laws that we have. As the pressure increases, the volume decreases. So there's an inversely uh, relationship or indirect relationship between uh, pressure and volume. And I think you uh, did this in your laboratory. I think one of the lab I uh, attended okay, uh, measured this type of what we call relationship. So this is based on Robert Boyle's uh, law, okay, wherein he says that the pressure is inversely proportional to uh, volume at constant temperature and at constant amount of gas. Okay, so what does it mean? As the pressure increases, the volume decreases. Okay, and the relationship that they have is this one. So we could just write it as P1B1 a equals to P2B2, giving you a constant relationship because they're what we call the same. Okay, so P1, B1 is equals to P2, B2. And that's the basis that you have in solving Boyle's law. Okay, so if you have a problem in Boyle's law, it's just going to ask you, okay, uh, what will be the corresponding pressure or corresponding volume if there's a change in pressure and volume. So if we have an example here, so a sample of chlorine glass occupies at a volume of 946 at a pressure of 726 millimeter mercury. So we can say that this is the B1 and this is the P1. And then you're going to ask what is the pressure of the gas in millimeter mercury if the volume is reduced at constant temperature to 154 ml. So we could say this is your B2. So putting that thing, you end up with this relationship. So you have this, you have this, okay? Uh, pressure would be the one that you're looking for and B2 is also given. So all you need to do is divide both sides by B2. Now you may ask, how about the unit? Do we need to change that? Well, it depends if it's going to ask you for a specific unit, but here it doesn't ask you to be a specific unit. So you might as well retain all of them. So if you're going to put here, 726 millimeter mercury times uh, what we call 946 ml divided by 154 ml. So if you're going to 
look at the unit here, you cancel out, and the one that you need will end up with what? Millimeter mercury. And as you could see here, 946, okay, to 154. So what happened to the volume here? It decreased, okay? And then you have 726. So what do you think happened to the pressure? Will it go up or down? Anyone? It's going to go up. And if you're going to do this operation here, you will get what value? You're going to get, I'm not sure, but this is what I get. If you round it up and I express it in three significant figures. It's 4459.7, right? So 4459.7, so you round it up to three significant figures, you got it around this one. So as you could see, this is higher than this one, which is consistent to what we said about Boyle's law, okay? If the volume decreases, the pressure increases or vice versa, okay? So that's the first thing that you need to remember. And there's a problem like this in your uh, third exam. Now, the next thing that we're going to talk about, uh, I'm just in a hurry, but this is, go uh, this is what we call recorded and make available to you. I just have to do this because not all of you are what we call watching the video. And to compensate for those who watch, I'm, go, I'm using different materials, but the same topic that is covered here, okay? Now to, to compensate, uh, to what we call, look at the other uh, gas law that we have here, we now look at the relationship between the volume and temperature at constant pressure, okay? So when they found out in a capillary tubing, they have a mercury there and a gas at low temperature, this is how it is. At high temperature, this is what happened. So what happened here? Okay. The volume increases with increase in the temperature. Okay. And this is the basis of what we call the Charles law. As the temperature increases, the volume uh, decreases. So here, what happened here? Okay. A different temperature and volume, whatever the gas that you have there, P1, P2, Okay. There's a direct relationship between temperature at absolute scale, which is Kelvin, and the volume. Okay. So this is synonymous also to the so-called Gay-Lussac's law, wherein they look at the effect of pressure with respect to what we call temperature. But the Charles law will just tell us the relationship like this one. So as the temperature increases, the volume also increases. And the uh, everyday applications that we have here would be the hot air balloon, okay? So if you inflate the balloon, the hotter the uh, temperature, the higher is the volume that you have. So one problem that we can have here is similar to this one, okay? So if you're going to lead uh, the, the problem here, so you have a sample of carbon monoxide gas uh, occupies 3.20 liters at 125 degrees Celsius. At what temperature will the gas occupy a volume of 1.54 uh, liter if the pressure remains constant? So here, the thing that you need to do, okay, you have this B1 over T1 equals to B2 over T2. So we can assign this as the B1, and then this one is the T2, but we have to make sure that this is converted to what? Your T1 should be converted to absolute scale. So if it's 273 added to 125, so this is equals to what? 398 Kelvin, right? Oh, I think, uh, what's the answer? Is it? 
Well, it's 398, right? So the way that you're going to do is you have to calculate for T2. So rearranging this, uh, what we call the relationship that we have, then we do a cross multiplication here. So B1, T2 equals to B2, T1. And since we're trying to get for this, we just divide both sides by B1. And then, except for the temperature that we're going to change the unit, we can retain whatever unit that we have there. So 1.54 liter times uh, 398 Kelvin divided by uh, 3.20 liter. So you have here a unit in Kelvin, and that is equals to 3.20. So as you're going to look at here, the volume becomes what? 3.20 to 1.54. So the volume decreases, so the temperature should also decrease. So if you're going to do this calculation, what do you get? One ninety one point sixty one, or if you round it up, that would be around one ninety two Kelvin. Now, if in the exam the choices that you have, okay, is in Celsius, then you only have to what one ninety two Kelvin, okay. It's just equivalent to what in terms of Celsius. So Kelvin is equal to 273 plus Celsius. So if you have 192 equals 273 plus C. So rearranging this one, you will have 192 minus 273. You get Celsius equals to negative 81. Is that right? If the temperature is in terms of Celsius, okay. So there, there's a problem similar to this also in your exam three and most likely in the final exam. Okay. Now the next one that we have, uh, the so-called Avogadro's law. So in Avogadro's law, you look at the amount of substance with respect to the volume, because the one that is constant is temperature and pressure. So they said, they found out that the volume is directly re re related to the number of moles, okay? Wherein you have B1 over N1 equals to B2 over N2. And they were able to look at this in the reaction that they have here, okay? As the volume of the gas uh, increases with increase in the number of moles of a given substance. Okay, now if we're going to summarize what we have so far, because this natural loss gives one uh, overall loss, uh, law to, to, to direct the relationship that they have. So in the Boyle's law, increase in, uh, in pressure is indirectly proportional with uh, volume. So as the volume decreases, the pressure increases. As the volume increases, the pressure decreases, okay? And then in terms of the Charles law, higher the temperature, higher is the volume. Okay, so there's a direct relationship between uh, volume and temperature. Okay, in terms of Avogadro's law, we have what we call the relationship between the volume and the moles. So if you're going to look at this, we have, we have what? P1, B1 equals to P2, B2. And then you have B1 over T1 equals to B2, T2. And then you have here also B1 over N1 equals to B2, N2. Okay. So if you're going to round them up, there's always what a constant on them. And if you're going to combine the, the, the factors that we have here, so you will see all the B are up. And then down will be what? N1 and T1. So when you have that thing, that will give you a constant. And this is the idea of the so-called 
ideal gas equation. So in the boil flow, there's a indirect relationship between pressure and volume at constant N and T. In the Charles law, there's a direct relationship between the volume and the temperature at constant N and P. And then Avogadro's law, there's a direct relationship between volume and the numbers of moles. So if you're going to look everything here, you end up with this one. So if you're going to look at this relationship that you have here, P2B2 equals to N2 T2. Now, as you could see here, you can derive each of the law. So if you have what we call the Boyle's law, this denominator will cancel out because they have the same N and T. If you have the Charles law, so the Charles law is just this one. So this will cancel out because they just have the same value, constant N and T. Now, if you have Avogadro's law, it says BN over that. And this is what we call the ideal gas equation, PB equals to NRT. And the value of R, we could say, okay, is either 0 0.0821 liter atmosphere K mole over K mole or 8.314 joules per K mole. So what's the difference between the two R? Non-energetic problem energetic problem. So this deals with energy, this deals with non-energy situation. That's the difference between the two, okay? Now there's also a special condition at zero degrees Celsius and one atmosphere of pressure, and that's what we call the STP, the standard temperature and pressure. And at STP, you can determine one mole, of an ideal gas. So, so what does it mean? At standard temperature and pressure, you can determine okay, the volume of one mole, any gases, as long as it is one mole of gas at standard temperature and pressure that's equals to 22.414 liter, okay, a little bit bigger than a basketball. Huh? So how did they do that? getting what we call the, the, the R, okay? So you put the atmosphere, the number of moles, okay? The 22.4, uh, one per liter, and then 273.15 standard condition, and you can get this one. So that's the 0.0821 that you can use. And you did this in your laboratory, the one that you're given the data, okay? So at STP, the gas, uh, the molar volume of one mole of gas, or is molar volume is usually the volume of one mole of gas. That's 22.414. Any gas sample will contain the same volume at STP. Okay. Now, what's the calculation that you can have here? A lot. Okay. So you can play around with what we call the PB equals to NRT. And even this N, that can still simplify to what? PB equals to MRT over molar mass, or you end it like this one. So you can determine the molar mass, you can determine the mass if the mole is not given. Now here, you are asked to calculate what? The volume occupied by 49.8 grams of HCl at STP. So how are we going to solve this problem? Okay, so maybe we can get what? The moles. So you have what? 49.8 grams of HCl, and then you multiply it with, for every one mole, you have, the molar mass of HCl, which is 36.45 grams. And when you have that, that is equal to, if I'm not mistaken, 1.37 moles. So you use it here. So you're asked for the volume. So PB equals to NRT divided by pressure. So you have 1.37 moles and then 0.08. To one liter atmosphere K mole 
So STP, so that means your temperature is at around 273 Kelvin, zero degrees Celsius. And the pressure is equals to one atmosphere. So if you're going to cancel out the unit there, so the one that remains is liters. And what do you have here? Uh -huh. One point two three seven times point zero eight two one times two seventy three divided by one. I have this. I don't know if you can see it. <laughs> so thirty point uh, seventy one or uh, we have three significant figures, 30.7, okay? So the, the question that you may ask will just be any of the, what we call uh, four item there, okay? Here is just the pressure. You may be asked for the volume. You may be asked for the moles. You don't know as long as you know how to manipulate this one. Now, another thing, as I've told you, you, you can have a lot of derivative here. So from this one where we derive, we can get for the molar mass. Or from this relationship that we have, we can put this on one side, okay? And then divide both sides by RT. What do we have here? What is this relationship where P times molar mass, pressure times molar mass over RT is equals to M over B? This is equals to your density. So you can derive it from uh, thing. So this one is another way for you to solve it. Okay. So here, the one that is being asked is for the, the final pressure, but uh, I'm not going to. Uh, Solve this one because I'm trying to get more time for review. Okay, so the way that I told you earlier, uh, the density, okay, you can derive it from PB equals to nRT. Okay, so that's the mass of the gas in grams over the uh, what we call volume in liters. Okay, and from that you can also have the molar mass m. Uh, the molar mass is equal to density times R times T over P, okay? And I'm, I have one example here. Because you have a uh, 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 problem like this in the exam. So here, you're still just going to use the PB equals to NRT. Now, you may not be given this formula. So just in case you're not given, you have to derive it. So from this, okay? MRT over molar mass. So you put it on one side, divide it with RT and volume. So you will have here, ah, uh, no, you, the one that's being asked is what? The molar mass, so you have PM, RT, uh, Maybe let's do it like this. P, B, M equals to M, R, T. So you want this one on one side. So you divide both sides by P, B. So you have molar mass is equals to the mass times gas constant times temperature over pressure and volume. So if you have it here, 4.65 grams, 0 0.0. 8 to 1 liter atmosphere k mole and then times 
the temperature here. So 27, you have to make it into Kelvin. So that is around 300 over one atmosphere times 2.1 liter. So what do you have? So what's the molar mass that you have? So if you're going to look at the unit, liter, liter, Kelvin, Kelvin, atmosphere, atmosphere. So you have a unit of grams per mole. Okay, so you have 54 point something, 54.5. Now, there are other problems uh, in gas, but I think the one that will be covered uh, is already discussed, okay? You can also do some stoichiometry in gas, like this one. So the rule that you have in the stoichiometry of, of what we call gas, you're given the amount either in grams or volume, and then you get the moles of reactant, and then you get the moles of the product. The same thing that you have in stoichiometric problem, okay? And then you're going to determine the amount of gas either in grams or volume. So in, in example here, what is the volume of CO2 produced at 37 degrees Celsius, one atmosphere when five grams, 5.6 grams of glucose are used up in the reaction? So this is a classic um, photosynthesis reaction. So if you're going to look at here, so you're given 5.6 grams. So from here, okay. You need to convert this to the moles of C6H12O6 and then to the moles of CO2 and then to the volume of CO2. So that's the pathway that you have. Okay. So this may not be in your fourth, uh, third exam, but this will be one question that they usually ask in the final exam, which is ACS. So you just follow that uh, route that we have here. So 5.60 grams of C6H12O6, okay? So to go to this one, what do you multiply it with? For every one mole of C6H12O6, you have how many? 180 grams? That's the molar mass of that thing. And then what is the mole ratio here? For every one mole, you have six mole of CO2. So maybe we stop there, okay? Because from mole to volume, that is an ideal gas equation, but we have to get first, what's the corresponding mole based on the stoichiometry? So 5.6 divided by 180 times 6, what do you get? Anyone? Point one eight seven moles of CO two. Now, once we have that, so we have PB equals to NRT. So what we get there is just N. So what's being asked is 
the volume. So we just divide this with P. So we replace NRP over P with the value that we are given. So 0.187 moles, uh, 0 0.0821 liter atmosphere K mole. And then the given temperature 37 plus 273, so that's 310K. And then pressure, which is one atmosphere. And what do we get? So unit that we have, uh, moles, oh, no, 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 no. Kelvin atmosphere, so the unit is in liter. So how many liter do you have? Four point seventy six liter. Question. Now, the remaining part that I have is just some other aspect in the gases. Okay. Now, it's just so odd that of all the three physical states that that you don't see, okay, uh, I mean, gas is the one that you don't really see, okay, that's the one that has the most uh, natural loads. So we have discussed some of them already, okay. So there's another what we call loads that came from John Dalton, uh, the atom, atomic structure uh, thing, okay. So what John Dalton says that if you're going to look at the pressure of gases in a container, if you're going to mix these gases, okay, the total uh, they will just give the total pressure of all the respective uh, pressure of gas, okay, at constant volume and temperature. So you have the pressure of gas one and the pressure of gas two. When you mix them together, okay the new pressure is just the total pressure of the uh, pressure of those uh, gases that you have, okay? So so, so the way that it, it, it has here is uh, they won't react with one another. So what they do is there's just an accumulation of pressure. So in my uh, recorded lecture, I have an example there. I, I just don't have time to discuss this thing uh, to you, okay? So the... Dalton's law of partial pressures just states that in a, for a mixture of gases, the total pressure is just equals to the sum of all the partial pressures of the gases in a given mixture. That, that, that's the uh, take home message that I want you to know. And uh, another topic also that is included in my recorded uh, lecture is what happened if you're collecting a gas over water. So the way that you're going to do this thing, this is similar to the experiment that you have. So it, it's an application of the law of uh, partial pressure, Dalton's law of partial pressure, where the total pressure is just the pressure of the oxygen gas and the pressure exerted by water at a given temperature, okay? So pressure, the water, you think it's a liquid, but it has uh, what we call the vapor pressure corresponding at a given pH. And there's a table of that in your laboratory manual, okay? So the vapor pressure of water with temperature is given to that, like this one. So if you have water included there and you are in atmospheric pressure, so all you need to do to get the vapor pressure of the air is subtract 760 with the respective uh, vapor pressure of water at a given temperature, okay? 
So as you could see, at 100 degrees Celsius, the water vapor is already 760 because all of the water are already what? In gas form. And remember, only gases exert pressure. So you might say, oh, professor, you said only gases exert pressure. How come water has pressure here? Now you have to remember that the, the, the form of the uh, water in, in this one exceeding vapor pressure, they are in the form of gas. Okay? At 100 degrees Celsius, all of the waters are already in gaseous form. That's why it's equal to the atmospheric pressure. Okay? Now, one thing that uh, describes the behavior of these uh, gases is the so-called kinetic molecular theory. So this is a model to describe the gas behavior. And it has uh, several statements on it. So what it does is it tries to what we call uh, describe the behavior of the gases. So a gas is composed of molecules that are separated from each other by distances far greater than their own dimension. So the, the molecules can be considered to be points, that is they possess mass but have negligible volume. So as you could see, the statement that I have here is much stronger than the other recorded lecture that I have there, okay? So what does it mean? Since they don't have definite shape and definite volume, they're far from one another. Okay, so even though the volume is negligible, they still contain mass. And the mass that they have, you divide it with a negligible volume will give you a lower density. Okay, so when you say negligible volume, the volume is so large. It has no definite shape. It has no definite volume. And then, Gas molecules, they're mostly moving in a constant random motion. Okay? They, and when they collide uh, with one another, the collision is elastic. So I usually have a setup that I showed in class like this one. So if you have this one, it hit there. If, the, if this is an elastic collision, whatever energy that hit here, it's the same energy that will force the last ball to the last item. So if you have it like this, it will move like that. So whatever the force that you have here, it will be the same force that it will push this thing uh, on it. Okay. Uh, gas molecules exert neither attractive nor repulsive forces on one another. There's no attra uh, intermolecular forces of attraction. That's why in your chem 112, okay, the first chapter that you have there is liquids and solid and the forces of attraction. That's the main difference between the two physical states compared to the gases. They have uh, what we call intermolecular forces of attraction. Gases, they don't have. And one thing here, uh, the average kinetic energy of the molecules is proportional to the temperature of gas in Kelvin. So we could say the, the temperature is just the speedometer of your gas molecule, okay? So if the energy is higher, the temperature is also higher. So temperature is just measurement of the energy that you have. So any two gases at the same temperature will have the same average kinetic energy, whatever is their, uh, what we call mass, okay? So the average kinetic energy of molecules is proportional to the temperature of gas in Kelvin. So at zero Kelvin, there's no movement at absolute zero. Okay. Now, this kinetic zero gas that's applicable why you can compress gas, why there's an indirect relationship between pressure and volume, because the pressure there is just equals to the collision rate with the wall. Okay. So when there is more collision rate with the wall of the gas molecule, that means there's a higher pressure, okay? And this collision rate will come with greater number. Why? Because they're closer to one another, the smaller volume, okay? So we could say uh, the number of density that you have there is inversely proportional to the volume. So the lower the volume, the higher is the density. So that's the basis of the Boyle's law, okay? Charles' law is also the basis of what we call kinetic molecular theory. As we have discussed, the pressure 
uh, depends on the collision rate with the wall. So collision rate is equals to what? The average kinetic energy of the molecule. So if there's a higher kinetic energy, then there would be a higher temperature, okay? So we could say here that the pressure is at least related to temperature in this portion. I think this is more on the Gay-Lussac's law compared to the Charles law, okay? But, but the way that we do is you, you're going to relate the pressure here with the volume that you have. <clears throat> now, in terms of Avogadro's law, the collision rate, okay, uh, that's where the pressure is uh, in, uh, directly proportional to the N. So what it's just trying to do is the kinetic molecular theory was able to explain all behaviors that is observed in the natural gas law. Okay, and if you're going to look at this, uh, what we call distribution of speeds at different temperature here. So as you could see here, at 100 uh, Kelvin, this is the distribution that you have. There's only a small portion uh, of, of them at a particular speed. But if you increase the temperature, so the speed that they have becomes higher, okay? So temperature here, 300 uh, Kelvin, so at helium, nitrogen, and chlorine. So what can we say about this one? The same temperature, but deeper in what we call molar mass. So which one it moves faster if we have this, what we call flat? Because here you have the same gas, but deeper in temperature. So here you could say faster movement, but here same temperature, but deeper in gases. So what can you say about this one? Helium one, move faster or slower compared to the other? You're going to look at the molecular speed that you have here. So helium, the lightest of them all, moves the fastest. The lighter the gas, the faster it moves. Okay, just imagine Usain Bolt and a sumo wrestler running side by side. So the one that is lighter will move faster. That's what this graph tells us, okay? And if you're going to look at the relationship that they have here, so the speed, the root mean square is just equals to the square root of three times RT over the molar mass. And I think I have an example of this in the recorded lecture, okay? Now, the one that gases are known for is what we call diffusion. So we have diffusion and expulsion. So this is just a spread of what we call gas, okay? So diffusion more on gradual mixing of molecules of one gas with molecules or another, or another by virtue of their kinetic energy. Why do we smell perfume, okay? Why do we smell <laughs> the good and the bad uh, odor around us? Because of the gas being able to diffuse. Okay, it moves at random motion. So here, so this is between uh, ammonia and HCl. So you could see something that is happening here. So between ammonia, which is what? NH3 and then HCl. So when they react together, they form this one. But which one moves faster between the three? So this one moves faster. That's why you see the reaction closer to here because the movement of this is already here compared to this one. This is what, 35 or 36 something? And this is just what, for 17 grams per mole, the molar mass here. So this is lighter, so it will travel faster. That's why you see the formation of ammonium chloride more closer to the HCl, okay? Now, Diffusion is just the gradual mixing. Effusion, this is the process by which gas uh, under pressure escape from one compartment to the, uh, uh, one container, uh, compartment of container to another. Maybe you, you example, uh, everyday example, there's the balloon. What happened to the balloon after several days? I don't know if you're a kid, like uh, my, my uh, daughter, he bring a balloon from a birthday party. And then a day after, what will happen to the balloon? 
So he, he, when he brought it, when she brought it home, it's around here, and then the next date will be what? Okay, usually it's on the floor already, and he will cry. Daddy, what happened? <laughs> so what, how do you solve to make it go up again? <laughs> you have to put more gases because the explanation there is. Uh, you, you can hit it. Yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Okay. The explanation is some of the gases, what, what we call the escape to the small hole. And if you're going to look at the rate, it's just this one. So the rate is inversely proportional to the square root of the molar mass. Okay. So the higher the rate or the longer, the, uh, the shorter the time is for that to travel, okay? And I have an example of this in the recorded lecture. And the last part that we have here, so we talk about ideal behavior, right? So when can you apply this one? At what conditions you can apply this? You can only apply this at low pressure and... <laughs> high temperature, okay? And as we all know, it's hard to have an ideal situation in a real world, right? Look at your everyday experience. Ideally, you want something, but reality won't allow you to do that. The same thing with the gas. An ideal gas equation usually would behave like this, but there's always what we call deviation. So there's always the presence of attractive forces or repulsive forces. When does it happen? What happens if the pressure is high? They become close to one another. And when they close become close to one another, there could be forces that will interact. Okay. At low temperature, it happens. At high temperature, they're far from one another. But at low temperature, they can be close to one another. And that results to forces that cause, that results to deviation. So what are these deviations? This one, hydrogen, methane, ammonia, okay? So the effect of this is they could exert, uh, what we, the effect of the intermolecular forces on the pressure exerted by a gas. So we could say now there's no elastic condition anymore. So what do they do? They, what we call modify the PV equals to NRT by putting some, numbers here okay so this is what we call the corrected pressure and the corrected volume and each gas they have this a and b values that you use so that uh non-ideal equation is known as the van der waals equation so this is what uh the thing was all around okay and unfortunately i have to repeat it because not all of you watch the video but to make sure that the other one who watch it won't hear the same thing that I have is I just use another source. Okay, so question. Question before we go to the review. Uh, indirectly, I already what we call give a review on the gases. So what I'm going to do is that the other chapter. So remember, our exam is just made up of what? Chapter 9, 10, and 5. And later this week, I'm going to show you some sample calculation, that the short video that I'm going to post. And I think you know what to do now after your experience in your uh, exam too, right? So question. Question? Still have around 30 minutes. Question class. You can type the question while I just get some water. Okay. Now give me a minute or two. And then we'll start a review.
Go on, type. So just like uh, before, you have what, 25 items in the exam, multiple choice, okay? So I think most of the calculation will be here and some of chapter nine, the bonding thing the bond formation, the delta H there, okay? So maybe you can just watch a video, for example, here. So if we're going to look at chapter nine, we started with what? The ionic versus covalent thing, right? So in the ionic versus the covalent thing, uh, we discuss about the ionic, so you might encounter here about salt having what? Highest melting point or lowest melting point. This is affected by what? Remember the Coulomb's law? The higher the charge, the higher the energy or the higher, the higher is the melting point. The smaller the uh, atom or ion, the higher is the energy. I, if you still remember, F equals to the Q, Q over R something, okay? So you're going to have a question like, you're given the salt, which one is the lowest salt? I think the example that you have here before is this one and this one, right? And between the two, which is the higher melting point? Like this, like this, like this. Anyone? What's the relationship in terms of melting point between MgO and NaCl? So if you're going to look at this, you will have what? Mg2 plus and O2 minus, and then you have Na plus and Cl minus. So the charge here is higher on this side, so which is more smaller. So usually, okay, the more positive the sign is, the smaller is the substance, right? So you have to study that portion because you're going to have some salt, and you are asked which is which is the highest or the lowest melting point. Maybe you can look at some of the uh, questions that you have there in your uh, classes. Let me see if I can open the paste class. So between the two, okay, this one would have the higher melting point. So some aspect that you have here, this one, that's a higher Q, that's a higher charge compared to that one. And if you're going to compare between Mg plus, Mg2 plus and Na plus, this is much smaller compared to that one. Okay, remember what happened? What happened to Mg2 plus? You remove an electron. So try to look at the ionic size that you have. And we're talking about ionic size. So what will happen if you have Mg, compare it to Mg2 plus in terms of electron configuration? Do they have the same electron configuration? So one would have the NS2 and the other one would not have an NS because you lost two electrons. So you have to, what we call, look at that. And synonymous to that, you have to know what the isoelectronic means.
Is this isoelectronic with this? Yes or no? F minus is isoelectronic with oxygen two minus or oxide. Chloride is isoelectronic with oxide. So when you say isoelectronic, they have the same electron configuration. So I want you to look over that thing. Okay. So how uh, we can say, I'm going to clear the drawing there. How is this different from this in terms of electron configuration? Okay. Now, I want you to go to the different definition of terms that happen. Because you might be asked a question about that. So what are the definition of terms that you encounter? Uh, electronegativity, dipole moment, The, the there's I think a polar covalent bond something. So you you might have questions encounter like that. Okay. So if you're going to look at this one, the, these are both copper. So what's the difference? This is a copper two plus. This is the copper. Okay, the metal copper. So how do they differ in their electron configuration. So that's what I mean, uh, I want you to know, okay? And then uh, in the Bornhaber process, there are what we call different reactions that is happening. So when, when, when one that uh, has this so-called ionization and when one does has this so-called electron affinity, so it's just where your what hydrogen is. So for instance, if you have M, okay. So if you put the electron here, so it will give you what? M minus, right? But if you do it like this, what will happen to M? M will become negative. So which represent here ionization energy and which represent here electron affinity. So this represent electron affinity because you're adding electron, you're making it more an ion. Ionization is you're making it more an ion. So that's the thing that you need to determine, okay? And what's the main focus on chapter nine? We go to Lewis structure. So you have to know that, that, that electron, that symbol, okay? And when you are asked to write the Lewis structure, you have to know what? The first thing that you always do is you determine the number of valence electrons. So that is based on the group number that you have, the group number, at least in the representative elements, rep, uh, pertains to the number of the outermost electron that you have, okay? So you may ask question, how many valence electron that you have? And if you have a positive and a negative, what does it mean? If you have a positive sign, is that plus one or minus one electron? Okay, so if you have a positive sign, that's a minus one electron. If you have a negative sign, that's a plus one electron. So those, th th those are the things that you need to consider. The, the bulk of what we call uh, chapter nine and chapter 10 has this so-called Lewis structure, okay? And then you may also be asked, remember the formal charge that we have discussed before? So you might be given one, uh, what we call molecule, and you are asked to get what's the formal charge of each element in a given molecule. And if you have a hard time uh, thinking about 
what has been discussed. Uh, I don't know if you knew it, but if you're going to look at our classes, do you see classes now? Okay. So if you're going to look at the content, there's a link for that recording. You can go back to it. Okay. So if you're going to look at this, if I'm not mistaken, this is the one hour one, and this is the 30 minute, I mean the, uh, no, not the one hour, that's uh, the, the one whole chapter discussion. This one, uh, usually multiple class. So I want you to go back to that recording that you have. There's a recording there to guide you if you still don't know how to do, get the formal charge. Okay. So, so that's uh, one thing that you have. And then maybe you can also look at this concept of resonance. If you still remember what the resonance is, you still remember what the resonance is? What do you have in the resonance? I think the classic example that we have is this one, right? Okay, so it can exist this way or this way. But the truth is, they're just equivalent. The true form is the average between the two. Okay. So try to look if you have a question about it in the, I think I can put you here. So remember, you always have this so-called chapter uh, reviewer. So maybe try to go to chapter 10. No, it's not chapter 10, it's what we call chapter nine. So if you're going to look at here, okay, so maybe you can look at some of the stuff here. So maybe they have some resonance question uh, around here, like that one, okay? So try to go over them, okay? And then what else? The number of lone pairs. So you know what a lone pair is? So if you have NH3, how many lone pairs do you have? So usually it's around this, right? So you may ask the question like that. Okay, so it, uh, if you're asked a question, how many lone pairs, the only way for you to answer that is write the so-called uh, Lewis structure, okay? And then you go in the octet rule. Which are the strict followers? What are the usual uh, exception to the octet rule? Because some can have less done, some can have more done. So you might have questions like that, okay? So everything at this, at this part is uh, something to do with the Lewis symbol, okay? And the calculations that we have at the end, uh, the bonding thing, okay? I'll try to make a video on that and make it available by the weekend. And then when we go to chapter 10, we have what, geometry? Most likely you will be given that piece of paper that were given to you in class, okay? So included in that is what we call the band angle, right? So linear is 180, trigonal planar is 120, tetrahedral is around 109, okay? A trigonal bipyramidal is a mixture of 120 and 90 degree angle. And octahedral is a mixture, it's just 90 degree angle. So you have to know that. And then included here is the number of sigma and pi. 
So maybe let's put an example here. So if I have it like this. So how many sigma and how many pi do you have? And I can also include here hybridization. So what's the hybridization of this? What's the hybridization of this? So how many sigma do you have here? So the sigma is usually what? All bonds, double bond or single bond. The pi is the one in double bond. One pi in one double uh, in double bond and two pi in a triple bond. So if you're going to look at here, there's what? One, two, three. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, sigma. You think you can answer a question like this? So the sigma is any bond that you have. Whether it's a triple or a double or a single, there's always one sigma. Now, if there's a double, there's one pi. If there's a triple, there's two pi. Now, hybridization for this, this is what? SP2. And this is sp3. Let's try to look at the some questions that you have like that. So you see the example class? So this is the chapter 10. So maybe you have it like this. <clears throat> so what is the hybridization of nitrogen atom at the nitrite ion? So what is nitrite? NO2 minus, right? So if you're going to write the NO2 minus, so what is the hybridization there? So if ever we're going to write it like this one. So how, how much do we have here? So this is five plus two times six plus one. So you have six, 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 18. So you may end up 18 minus six, that will give you 12. So what do you have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So what's the hybridization of N here? So this is a bent. So if I'm not mistaken, one bond, another bond, another bond. So that's an SP2. Because you have a double bond there, so that means one of the P is a pi bond. Am I right? Try to look at the answer key. Twenty nine 
Where is that? I go back to the thing. SP2, that's what I said. Is that the right one? So here, you might be given this one. So you might ask which one contains an SP3 hybridized carbon atom. So based on this, I said this one is a hybridized. Okay, oh, the hybridized, but this one is SP2. So the one that only has, I think letter A is the answer because this one SP2, SP3, SP, SP2, 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 SP. Okay, so try to work on this thing here. And one thing that will make it a little bit challenging, we could say, where's that example? Oh, they don't have an example here. The one that has this molecular orbital uh, theory, the one that has this so-called, uh, where is it? I'm trying, I'm trying to find. the PowerPoint slide. The one that you have like this one. So which among these molecules is diamagnetic? How is one paramagnetic and how is one a diamagnetic? Usually if you have an unpaired electron that's paramagnetic. If you have it like this one, that's diamagnetic, no unpaired. This one, diamagnetic. This one, there's an unpaired that's paramagnetic. So the way that you're going to put this is you're just going to fill up based on the number of uh, electrons that you have from the atoms. Okay, so for instance, what do you have here? Li2. Li would have what? How many valence electrons do they have? One. So one from Li and another one from another Li atom, okay? So when you combine them, you only filled up the lowest one because you only have two, okay? So you end up with this one. So that's that's the question that you have there. Uh, identifying which one is a diamagnetic or paramagnetic thing. I think that's the, the most challenging that we have in our part. Question. <clears throat> 